Hello, hello, everyone. Happy Thursday. Welcome to another version of VMRY. I have the distinct pleasure of co-discussing with one of our uh, Academy team members. Uh, but today we're we're in for a special treat because Kirtan's presenting not his first, but actually his second case on VMR this week. And I just told him I went through his first uh, case on Monday. It was really, really educational. So I'm very, very excited to uh, to see what he has in store for us today. Uh, but as always, we can't do this without the CP Solvers team members who um, are uh, sitting at the helm, making the logistics and the fun happen. Um, first being Julia, who's scribing. So I'll pass the mic to you, Julia, to say hello. Hello, hello. A uh, new background for me today. We are celebrating my granddad's 80th birthday, so I'm very excited. Um, but primarily excited for the case today, and I'm very, very grateful to uh, learn from you guys. How are you guys celebrating? Oh, he invited all the people that he still... Um, I think that he loves and are still alive. I think that's a limiting factor, to be honest. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Um, yeah. We all went to a hotel. That sounds really, really cool. Is that where you are right now? Yes. Amazing. But okay. there's not very quite spots, so I hope it's fine. But <laughs> oh, I appreciate you chiming in, especially on such a wonderful day for your family. Harry, good morning. I know it's bright and early. <laughs> yeah, good morning. I'm not doing anything that fun uh, right now. But uh, hi, everyone. I'm Harry. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'm doing teaching points. Hopefully, I can keep up with Kirtan's case and all the wonderful <laughs> things we're going to learn. Thanks. Uh, what that. time? What time was your usual rise and shine, Harry? Oh, uh, around now. So okay, not too bad. Right, cool. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you hopping in so so early. Sure. Um, the final person we have to introduce you to is Elena, who I, does not need an introduction. Um, in the last year, she's become a pivotal member of our team and is literally one of our VMR leaders. And um, I think. With uh, Kirtan, Elena, Julia, and Harry being actively involved today, I'm not sure what I'm going to do. So I'm going to sit back and enjoy the awesomeness that this uh, team has become and continues to evolve, which is just such a special treat. And I say that in large part also to emphasize to all of you who are not here um, and are listening on YouTube, um, this is not meant to be a session where we talk and you all listen. And the ultimate goal is for all of us to be talking. And so if you are listening in remotely on YouTube and are on the fence about joining live, um, this community is made up of people who made that leap and will actually completely collapse if more and more and more people don't do that. So please, please, please consider joining us live. You can find everything you need on our website about how to join. Um, Elena is probably wondering somewhere in her very kind heart, about uh, this case. And so I'll pass the mic to her to say a quick hello, and then we'll jump right into Kirtan's magic. Yeah, thank you, Robbie, for such kind words. Um, I have joined uh, the CP Solvers like one and a half years ago. And um, yeah, it has like totally changed my uh, passion, I would say, for medicine. And it's not only because of the academy members, but everybody who is here today. Um, I had so much fun just engaging in the chat the first times that I joined and um, yeah, I just wanted to to learn more. And um, yeah, it's, um, you know, you have probably seen all the people that are behind the scenes, but I think what I was, um, despite all the medicine, what I was so impressed by is just um, how kind um, everybody is. And yeah, I've always felt that this is a safe space. And so I am uh, nervous, but um, yeah, I'll... <laughs> I feel in good hands. So I'm very excited for your case, Kirtan. Are you ready? Let's rock and roll. Perfect. Thank you so much, friends. This is after like almost four months that I got a chance to present case to Rabi. So I'm so excited. Thanks for the opportunity. So let's get started. A peril in the web is the title. I didn't say title first because Rabi always does this. I was like, no, this time Rabi has to hear this. There is no way, Ravi, no. Peril in the web, okay? <laughs> All right. So, the first eloquent, here we go. So, we have a 62-year-old gentleman who is presenting with one week of fever, chills, productive cough, and diarrhea. So, he was doing fine one week ago. That is when he started to develop all these symptoms. And apart from the cough, diarrhea, and fevers, he also has some degree of abdominal pain, confusion 
and non pruritic rash all over the abdomen he has not had any blood in the vomiting or the stools and i will also like to show you the picture of the rash before i end this aliquot because rash is the crucial part of this aliquot so i will share my screen So these are the legs. You guys got a good pick? Yeah, maybe uh, maybe Kirtan, we can just sort of describe it as best we can before we go back to the screen. How does that sound, Elena? Yeah, great. Um, so I think whenever I hear rash, I, um, I really want to know if the um, skin is intact or not. And here the skin is intact. And then you want to know if there's something like inside the um the skin I'm, i mean i'm not a dermatologist or if there's something like i'm um, showing off from from down there like vessels or something like that and i think i have seen such a rash before for example in patients who are in like septic shock um because um they like centralize and then um you would see such kind of rash um i'm forgetting i think it has like a specific I, th I think especially on the upper part of the legs, um, I'm not sure what it's called. I think it's like, uh, um, I think it's something that you also get when you have a shower. Yeah, um, don't worry about the name. It's okay. Yeah, what do you think I, the pathophysiology is? When you say sepsis, you were spot on as to, and I think that really uh, gets it gets you to the um, the crux of what's happening. And so what's your sense of what might be happening based on what you're seeing? basal constriction yeah exactly right exactly right so I'll, I'll arm you with the one word and i'll let you take it from there so uh, uh this is uh on the spectrum of livido and mm -hmm. um uh, the uh, team uh the schema team had an incredible episode about retiform purpura retiform purpura is the ultimate form of skin ischemia yeah. and that exists on the most extreme spectrum of progressive vasoconstriction beginning uh, with levito reticularis, which is the mildest version, and progressing to what's called levito racemosa, and then ultimately culminating in retiform purpura. We're not sticklers for terminology here, but Elena, I'm curious, what is your sense of the gradation of the vasoconstriction? Is it prominent to you? Uh, is it so mild would be reticularis, moderate would be racemosa, and severe would be retiform purpura. What's your sense of what you're seeing here? Um, I would say it's more severe. Yeah, I agree with you. I think that the technical definition of severe would be that you would see purpuric lesions. Um, so I think I'm more inclined to call it moderate based on the absence of overt purpura. The technical definition of levito racemosa versus reticularis is in levito reticularis, you have these um, uh, uh, these uh, uh, incomplete uh, hexagons, I believe. I forget how many sides there are, honestly. But in in uh, reticularis, the uh, the uh, the uh, hexagon is incomplete. It's hard from this distance, but I think zooming in, I'm seeing a couple of almost complete ones. This so this is not as mild as levito reticularis. Is probably on the spectrum of levito racemosa. And so I think we have to ask ourselves, why is the skin underperfused and um, and uh, and ischemic? From the very get-go, I will tell you that there's one really important mimicker here, and it's something that you may or may not have heard, heard of it. So we'll just try to iron out together. Can you think of a way where this rash is completely noise and actually doesn't signify anything that's going on in the rest of the body? Have you heard of this or... I only know that for levito reticularis, I think a lot of people have it when they're exposed to like some kind of like cold weather, cold showers. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Levito reticularis is certainly on the spectrum of Raynaud's phenomenon. It's very, very common, more common in women than men. Um, and that's certainly one way this could be a distractor. The other way is is uh, <laughs> is when patients use heating blankets. And um, the heating blankets cause damage to the skin. So if this person has been febrile, has 
a distant disease in the chest and in the GI tract and it has been cool and cold and using a strong heating blanket, that'll do exactly that. So I think uh, the only thing that I would ask this patient before investing deeply in this finding, in addition to the other findings, is to see are they using a heating blanket or not. And I say that because I've been faked out by it a few times now, and I promised myself I wouldn't do so again. And the location here is very heating blanket evocative. A lot of people put it on their laps, um, so I would want to make sure that's not the case. But I'm curious, how are you thinking about the rest of the syndrome? Yeah, I think um, it's very interesting. We have a very prominent inflammatory picture with multiple sites um, that could be um, part of this um, inflammatory syndrome. So from what I heard, we have like a 62 year old male with like one week of fever, um, non-productive cough, um, non-bloody diarrhea, abdominal pain, confusion, and this rash that we just saw. So um, I think whenever we have like a multi, um, a wide variety of symptoms, we I think there's two ways we can go. We can go for one symptom that we feel very comfortable with, or we can go for one that is very um, specific. Um, and I think um, the fever, we usually use the I made mnemonic um, for, and fever plus productive cough is really localizing me to an inflammatory disease um, of the chest, particularly um, of the lung. Um, so this would be very fitting with, for example, uh, pneumonia. Um, um, yeah, and I think the diarrhea is often a bystander in ma many um, inflammatory diseases of um, the upper res respiratory tract, the lower respiratory tract, and doesn't really have to uh, be the center of gravity. Um, I think what really concerns me is that Kirtan mentioned that the patient is confused. And I think um, in an, an older man uh, who is confused with an inflammatory um uh, syndrome, I really want to know how confused they are, um, if they're able to protect their airway, um, and um, yeah, if they um, are in withdrawal or something, if we like go on and frame this as altered mental status. Um, and yeah, I think cluing in this rash um, with the inflammatory syndrome, I would be very concerned, um, as I mentioned in the beginning, for a septic kind of picture. Um, and this gentleman, so I would really um, want to know the vital signs um, pretty soon. Um, yeah. That's absolutely superb. I have nothing to add on that reflection. I will just share a mental shortcut about patients who have an abrupt onset systemic syndrome, which is a, an abrupt onset inflammatory systemic syndrome, which is it's most often not an endogenous infection, if it is one, but rather an exogenous one. So something coming from the environment is much more likely to cause systemic symptoms at onset than an endogenous organism. So I think in this patient, a thorough review of his environmental exposures is going to be very, very key. Um, in parallel, you want to make sure that you have a good sense of why this patient might get so sick. And it might be because of the particular organism he has that will make anybody sick. But for somebody to get so sick so quickly, being open to the possibility there's a known or unknown vulnerability like an immunodeficiency that has been unleashed by this. So in some total, when somebody gets this sick this quickly, it could be that they went from zero to 100 from some unique tropism of disease. But more often than not, they were started at 50%, whether they knew it or not. And then this extra uh, hit took them uh, to the illness that they are. So I'm paying attention both to vulnerability and exposure so far. And when you have to pay attention to, 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 so, to so many different things at the same time, you should probably check your assumption that this is infectious and early on wonder if you need to pivot in a different direction. And so I think those three things are in the heart of my mind beyond the details that you outlined is where has this person been? What things have they carried with them as vulnerabilities to what's happening? And uh, is this unusual, widespread, and devastating enough that we have to expand even beyond the infectious bucket from the very get-go? All right, Kirtan, Mike, to you, my friend. Perfect. Awesome discussion, friends. And you are exactly right that this record is going to be the crucial one, which will have the most impact on the rest of the case, that what has been going on with the patient. So firstly, he this case is from in the summer months so he hasn't been exposed to any kind of cold and neither he has used any kind of heating blankets and the past medical history 
So he was diagnosed with angioimmunoblastic T cell lymphoma previous year in July or May. And at that time, this diagnosis was confirmed from skin, bone marrow, and lymph nodes, all three sites. He subsequently received one cycle of CHOIP, which is C-H-O-E-P, five cycles of CHOP, and then he underwent autologous stem cell transplantation. So this tra transplantation happened in December of 2023. So probably six to seven months before the current presentation. After he got the transplantation, he was not on any therapies for AITL. He was doing fine. But in March of this year, so which will be three months before the current presentation, he developed a rash on the legs, arms and scalp. The biopsy of that rash showed that there was spongiotic and psoriatic dermatitis. The dermatology thought it is probably not related to graft versus host disease. It is just random reaction which happened and patient has been doing fine since then and after the march patient used topical tacrolimus for this spongiotic dermatitis and the rash had cleared so the rash which we are seeing as of today just came up about one to two weeks ago it is new rash it has never happened before he is still not on any other medications his past medical history unremarkable no other diseases apart from aitl no substance abuse no illicit drug use no over-the-counter supplements and regarding the vitals 38.3 degrees that was the temperature and that's the only remarkable vital saturating well no tachycardia blood pressure is also holding good and on examination everything else is unremarkable apart from the non-blanching rash which we showed to you in the first aliquot and regarding his mental status so after talking to the family, he was confused at home, like he had word finding difficulties. But during my interaction and our team's interaction, he was alert and oriented to time, place and person. And we couldn't find any evidence of confusion or cognitive deficits. And that's the end of this eloquence. Very, very interesting, Elena. Uh, what, what thoughts are you having so far? Yeah, I think um, you emphasized in the last aliquot that what we're really going to look out for is um, a certain vulnerability and potential exposure in this patient. And um, so the patient has a, I think, um, indolent um, um, T cell lymphoma. It's not an aggressive one, but uh, the patient received the according um, therapy for it. Um, and I think, um, especially with the stem cell transplantation, um, we usually in, induce the patients with high grade uh, chemotherapy, and then they literally have like no immune system, and then they get this like new immune system. And um, it usually takes like one to three months for the uh, immune system to be able to um, work properly again. And then in the first year, they're like really um, in danger of. Um, as men, uh, um, Ketan mentioned, like something like uh, infections, but also GVHD um, of the liver or of the skin. Um, and I think what the, what happens a lot in the context of stem cell transplantation at, is that patients are um, um, facing prolonged neutropenia, um, which makes them very vulnerable for um, environmental infections, um, especially viral, but also fungal and um, I think there's like three kinds of uh, fungal infections, dermatophytes, yeasts, and molds. Um, and I think what we're really worried about in this patient is NGO-invasive um, fungal disease. So the dermatophytes are kind of out of this, um, but we're um, worried about like yeasts or, um, or um, NGO-invasive molds. Um, yeah, I think that's how far I can take it. Yeah, I mean, that's excellent. Yeah, I mean, you, you've really realized how deeply immunosuppressed this person is and the sequence of events from uh, uh, from cancer to, uh, to chemotherapy to transplantation. Uh, the one tweak I would make that's not relevant to this case, I don't think, is uh, the where you filed this lymphoma as. In angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphoma is one of the aggressive ones. And you can see how, how aggressive it is by, the, by what it was met with in treatment. So you see that this was there was essentially a trying to get a knockout blow for this lymphoma with completely annihilating the bone marrow and then replacing it. Um, it's a very fascinating lymphoma that tends to have a lot of autoimmune features. 
and a lot of vascular features, hence the name angiovascular. So leak, effusion, serocytis, and immunoblastic causes a lot of a cytokine storm, almost like a Castleman's-like cytokine storm with a lot of hematological issues like cyto uh, immune cytopenias. Um, and uh, that, I think, is interesting, but less relevant when the patient has been doing so well from a cancer perspective. Uh, here, uh, Elena, I have a large knowledge gap. And that knowledge gap is everything that you said definitely applies to transplants, right? All the things you said about immunosuppression and complications of transplant. The question is, does it apply in this case? And the reason I ask that is because this person has an autologous stem cell transplant, meaning that this is actually his bone marrow. You can transplant somebody's stem cells back to them in a case of lymphoma because the lymphoma is actually not a cancer of stem cells. It's a cancer of mature lymphocytes. So what has happened to this person is his own stem cells have been given back to him. And so as a result, he doesn't need to take immunosuppressive medications to prevent reactions of foreign uh, cells in his body to the rest of his body, which is why I imagine that dermatology wasn't too worried about graft versus host disease because the graft is the host, Right. And so I don't, I have a large knowledge gap. I've never thought about this before, about what are the complications of autologous stem cell transplantation? I can't imagine that it's even close to the complications of allogeneic stem cell transplantation in large part because from the get-go, you can look at that med list. How many times have you seen a med list with a transplant patient be essentially none? And I think that's very, very intriguing. So I think what I will have to do for the rest of this case is lean heavily on understanding what the foreground is, because my knowledge of the background and what it, what it brings is a little bit shaky. And so I think that I will be a little bit careful not to transplant my knowledge about, Alan, I was smirking at my own, uh, my own joke there, uh, uh, not, not to bring over the knowledge about allogeneic stem cell transplantation to this patient. And so That'll be an interesting twist, uh, which I'll definitely learn from this case because I've never thought about it before. So I, I, with that uh, with that surprise twist, Elena, I'm curious, what is that, any questions about that? What does that, what does that do for you reflexively? Because I imagine you also haven't thought about it too much. No, I, t I totally skipped over the <laughs> autologous, uh, and I just, like my mind just read yeah. uh, Elogy yeah. and Janae. Um, because of the, the clinical context and all of mm -hmm. that. And yeah, as you said, the NGO invasive is the aggressive one and the adult T cell lymphoma, for example, is the uh, indolent one. Yeah, I, um, yeah, we, we have plenty of time to think about uh, the complications. <laughs> <laughs> 100%. All right, Kirtan, what do you have next? Perfect. So now we move to the labs part. So patients, WBC count was 8.4 and the baseline was... 4.4, this was about three months ago. Hemoglobin, 8.4, same as WBC. Baseline was 13, two months ago. MCV, 115, it was 90 last time. Platelets, 3000, last time it was 114. BUN, 37. Creatinine, 2.1, baseline was 0. 0.8. AST, 162. ALT, 50, both of which were normal last time. ALP, GGT within the normal limits. LDH was 2,500. Last LDH was 500. Total bilirubin 3 and direct bilirubin 1.1. Urine analysis is obtained, which shows 3 plus blood, 9 RBCs, 3 WBCs. Blood cultures, urine cultures at this point in time unremarkable and his vitals are still the same. He is febrile but blood pressure is holding good and saturating well on rumen. And that's the end of the aliquot. Uh, awesome. Maybe I can just summarize the, the labs um, um, to give Elena some time to think and just ask one clarifying question. So it sounds like we have a new macrocytic anemia. And Kirtan, are the platelets uh, elevated at 3,000 or normal at 300? So... No, it's just 3,000. So they are very, very low. Severe very low. low. Okay, totally. Okay, just okay, 3,000. 3,000. Okay, we got you, got you. Uh, so uh, there we go. There's a massive update. Uh, we have a new uh, uh, anemia and thrombocytopenia along with acute kidney injury 
characterized by three plus blood, and you said nine RBCs and three white blood cells. We have an AST greater than ALT and a uh, predominantly indirect hyperbilirubinemia along with a very uh, elevated LDH. Um, so I think, Elena, your hypothesis that this is a systemic disease has borne through with such positive uh, blood analysis. And I'm curious how you're making progress. Yeah, I think, um, so in a patient with um, this hemoglobin uh, drop and the macrocytic uh, nature of this, I think we usually think of like the megaloblastic versus non-megaloblastic part. Um, so like um, fo folic acid and vitamin B12, a lot of um, medications can actually induce macrocytic uh, me megaloblastic anemia and then also just uh, um, toxins, reticular cytosis can do it. Um, but I, I think I'm not going uh, too much into that rabbit hole because uh, we have a platelet count that is low as well. Uh, so we are not uh, dealing with a single cytopenia, but with a bicytopenia. Um, and I think whenever we have a bicytopenia, we kind of uh, want to look at the bone marrow first, because most of the time it's uh, it's a, an issue with the production, um, be it from like a... a um, like an infiltration of the bone marrow or something with the stem cells themselves that they can't proliferate or uh, like an autoimmune phenomenon, which, which we have in aplastic anemia. Um, oftentimes the white blood cell count is low as well. Um, but at this time, it's just, um, it's just uh, the two other lines. I think something else that we have to think about when we have bicytopenia is um, still a peripheral, um, um, uh, um, degradation process like like a hemolysis so in this um, part I would be definitely very worried that there could be a DIC going on or um, also like a TMA like TTP so I would do the according tests for that um, and then I think that the AST is not too striking, um, um, but it's definitely um, like, I think more than three times the upper limit of normal, which um, is very definitely worrisome. I think whenever we have an AST that is greater than the ALT, we want to look outside of the liver first um, um, to maybe get a CK if there is um, destruction of the muscle. Um, and then, yeah, I think with the LDH, we just confirmed that there is some cell destruction going on, like be it in the blood or be it in the muscle itself. I think I'm most concerned for it being um, in the blood. Um, and then with the indirect hyperbilirubinemia, um, we sometimes see that in Gilbert's. Um, I think, think I would uh, look back at other labs if this has been there for like forever. Um, but I think also um, a problem with um, yeah, just hemolysis can do um, get this like indirect hyperbilirubinemia. Yeah. That's absolutely superb. I completely agree with your interpretation. When you see a new anemia in the context of uh, indirect hyperbilirubinemia, a markedly elevated LDH, along with AST, uh, ALT predominance, I think the picture of hemolysis is strongly emerging. And not only is it strongly emerging, I think you can also probably conclude that there's intravascular hemolysis. And the reason you can conclude that is that the patient has three plus blood and only nine red blood cells. If the nine red blood cells were accounting for the blood alone, you should only have one plus blood. And so here, there's a lot more blood showing up than there should be, which means the patient has more pigment in their urine beyond just the nine red blood cells. And the two pigment options are hemoglobin and myoglobin. And given Elena's argument for hemoglobin being in blood, this is a patient with probably intravascular hemolysis. And that helps you analyze and understand better what the MCV is from, and it's likely from reticulocytosis, but you wanna confirm that with a reticulocyte count to make sure that the MCV isn't a separate clue as to the cause of hemolysis. So for example, if the MCV is high because of Rouleau formation, that might, uh, false, that might uh, account for the hemolysis with cold agglutinin disease, which might then link in very well with the skin findings given the cold agglutin's propensity to cause vasoconstriction. So that's one reason why you wanna make sure that the MCV is in fact 
fully accounted by reticulocytosis rather than another separate uh, underlying clue. And so here we are and uh, analyzing this case from the hemolysis perspective and glossing over the platelets because as soon as you prove that the that the a hemoglobin issue is destructive, you can make that same inference with the platelet issue. And so you can make progress by saying, I'm going to assume that the platelet destruction is the same as, and so this patient has both anemia and thrombocytopenia that are probably destructive in nature. However, in isolation, when you have platelet counts this low, the depth of the platelet count is very evocative of a peripheral uh, process. It's very unusual to get isolated severe thrombocytopenia to this degree uh, from the bone marrow without proportionally affecting the white count. Um, and so I think that we're now asking why, or why is the hemoglobin and platelet being destroyed? And I think a very simplistic model is to ask, are they being destroyed because of the environment they are in? Are they being destroyed because of something on their membrane, like an antibody? Or are they being destroyed because something is going inside them like an infection bursting them open. And I agree with your instinct. Whenever you see them being destroyed in the context of kidney injury, you have to prioritize a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. I think that's really, really important. Equally important is prioritizing an infection because both of them are just as deadly. Um, it's not as crucial to diagnose an antibody-mediated membrane disease right away. So whenever you have anemia and thrombocytopenia, you want to ask, is there maha or is there an infection? And I think those two things should be your primary consideration. And the good news is the peripheral smear can offer tremendous insight into whether there is a microangiopathic process as evidenced by schistocytes, or there is a parasite or another infection that they can visualize. So that would be the first and most important thing that I would do. Um, it, it's very simple and thankfully very effective to analyze the antibody hypothesis on the membrane with a Coombs test. And so with those two tests, I think you'll be tremendously uh, wiser about the nature, uh, uh, nature of this disease process. Any other thoughts you wanted to add in, Ona, or any questions you had about it? So our hypotheses for the elevated creatinine would be um, like a TMA, plus minus pigment nephropathy. Yeah, I think, yeah, you're right. I think we have to, the, the core of the issue is the heme fingerprint. And once we understand that, if we see schistocytes, we'll call it a TMA. If we see the biziosis from prior transfusions, we'll call it a pigment nephropathy. So I think those are the, that uh, the kidney will likely not be elucidated uh, directly, but indirectly from elucidating what the blood is. All right, Kirtan, what do you have next? Perfect. So, friends, you know, one of the things that I have learned in residency is that sometimes time is the best thing, right? That we often have to see the labs, how they evolve across the time. So, for example, in TMA, when we say that we have renal injury, we are actually referring to intrarenal injury. If somebody has pre-renal or post-renal injury, then it's kind of difficult to link into TMA. So, what happened was I was taking care of this gentleman at night in the ICU. And as soon as I saw the labs, we know the protocol, right? That if somebody, you suspect that if they have TTP, then you want to involve the hematology and get the plaques right away. But before we jump into on, onto that bandwagon, the first thing we want to do is, as Rabi and Elena said, we want to get the peripheral smear and we want to rule out the antibody-mediated process because for TTP, if Coombs is positive, then TTP is usually out of the picture, right? So first thing I wanted to do was, call the lab and tell them that, hey, can you run the Coombs real quick right now? Because running Coombs is not that difficult. You can run it even at night. Secondly, I started the patient on fluids right away because remember the patient presented with like diarrhea and like was not eating well. As you could imagine, if patient is this sick, they won't be eating well. So as soon as I gave fluids, within three hours, I rechecked the creatinine. Creatinine is 0.6. So we proved that it is pre-renal. So that in that way, the, our suspicion for TMA is kind of going down by that margin. So now what happens that the repeat set of labs, which is obtained like six hours later, shows that WBC count is now 2000. So it went down. Hemoglobin again went down. So now it's like seven. And then it again went down to five. Platelets, 10,000. Coombs is obtained. And the lab calls me that everything in the smear is clumped. They can't see anything separate. Like everything is jumped together. So they said that all the labs which you are seeing 
could be affected. Everything could be affected because they are not able to run the sample. It's that clotted. So RBC agglutination is present. They run the Coombs test, which shows both IgG and C3 on the surface of red blood cells. Retic count 4.8. And as of now, the patient receives multiple transfusions, but patient is not responding to the blood transfusions. And that's the end of this record. Fascinating. Uh, Kirtan, can I just as just for timing, do you, how many aliquots do you have left? Uh let's see. Just a second. No problem. Mm. Yeah, I can I after this I can give one more piece of data and then okay. I will tell you guys to tell me the final diagnosis and okay. final set of investigations. Sounds great. Okay. All right. Thank you, Kirtan. All right, Elena, what happened there? <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I forgot what time it took for the for the other um, cytopenias to like go down even further. Can you remind me, Ketan? I'm sorry, Elena. You said the how many hours later did the um, <laughs> white blood cell count go down? This like four to six hours later. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know if this I, I'm I'm not too sure if this is like a lab error because they couldn't like measure it at all because all of the cells in were just clotting and um or it's like a uh, because you gave the patient um fluid so the all the um um cell counts went down like a little bit but this is definitely definitely significant so um in my mind there could be like a and a just um a process um, in the periphery that is destructing like the cells like very rapidly. Um, yeah, and then with the clotting, um, I wonder if there's like um, like an antibody that makes all the cells like stick together, um, which is why it can't be measured um, in the lab, um, but I'm not too sure about that. And then you uh, re re revealed with us the, um, the Coombs test. Um, and we look, usually look for antibodies in the blood or antibodies on the on the erythrocytes, which is the direct versus the indirect test. And we look for um, complements, IgG and IgM. And I think you said uh, complements and IgG were uh, positive. Um, and the IgG is um, usually or is a warm uh, hemolytic um, anemia, um, which is the most common one in comparison to the cold one. Um, and we can have that in the context of medications, um, lymphoproliferative diseases, autoimmune diseases. Um, a lymphoproliferative disease is, of course, um, very likely in this case. Um, and then with the retic count, we always want to get the, um, we always want to correct it with the hematocrit to see um, if if it's like hypo or hyperproliferative. But I think the important thing when you have reticular cytosis a normal or a low um, retic count is abnormal um, because you want your bone marrow to work more, so the retic count should go high. But I'm not sure about the about the number, uh, Ravi. Maybe you can tell me if 4.8 is low or normal. That was an absolutely excellent analysis. It's so methodical and sequential, and I think uh, I agree to the conclusions you're coming to. Uh, Kirtan, I always forget the different cutoffs, um, but this is just a math question. Uh, is the retic index high or appropriate or? So when you calculate the index, yeah. it will yeah. be low. It will it's be low. low. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Kirtan. That's very helpful. <clears throat> and I think that that's, that's key, right? Um, uh, Elena is, is, um, you know, you could essentially the concept that you're saying is the reticulites have to be proportionally high to the depth of the anemia. So if your even hemoglobin has halved, your retics should double. And so um, that's the concept to remember. It gets very confusing because often the numbers are different and you have to normalize the retic count to the index. And the index is just saying, <clears throat> are the retics as high as they should be? And the, how high they should be is exactly the opposite of how much the hemoglobin has dropped. And so here, the reticulocyte count is not as high as it should be. And I think that the first temptation that happens is you're saying, oh, wow, this person cannot be hemolyzing if they don't have reticulocytosis. And that's not true. Um, you could have a delayed reticulocyte response because it's too early, which is not an unfair thing for a weak lung syndrome, or there's not enough epopoietin because you have CKD, or that you actually have a bone marrow process like a CLL invading the marrow, also causing uh, destruction. 
but it should for a moment make you think, okay, is the patient not hemolyzing or are they actually hemolyzing in their bone marrow, ineffective erythropoiesis? So a great example of something that this could look like is a patient has B12 deficiency. And the reason they have hemolysis, is they're, they're, they're destroying their premature cells, including their reticulocytes. So to summarize, this patient has a hypoproliferative, hypoproliferative hem hemolytic anemia, which should make you doubt for a moment whether the case is hemolytic, but there's so much other evidence for it. So how could you solve this? It's too soon. Or patient has EPO deficiency, or they're actually hemolyzing in their marrow, either from an ineffective erythropoiesis, like B12 deficiency, or in a marrow invasive process. And so here, I think the retic index, um, the what should happen is you should not assume it's too soon. There is no EPO deficiency. So you should wonder, what is the state of the bone marrow? And that's a question that you have to wonder in this case, not just because of the low retic count, but the evolution of the bicytopenia into a pancytopenia, as Kirtan emphasized that the white count now became low. So it's a very fascinating space to ask is the patient has pancytopenia, which is very evocative of a marrow issue from the get-go. And the patient has a marrow issue that also is featuring peripheral destruction. <coughs> and of course, the elegant solution would be that the patient is destroying their cells in the marrow. Um, but we know that's not the only thing that's happening because the patient has antibodies that are positive, which means that they're also destroying their cells in the periphery. And there's not just destruction of the cells in the periphery, there's agglutination of the cells in periphery, further strengthening the mechanism that the antibodies are causing problems to this patient. And the clinical evidence of that agglutination we see on his skin. His skin is vasoconstricted as a result of red blood cells plugging in those areas. So I think the problem is coalescing into, we know this person is having peripheral destruction, but we have to wonder what's happening in the marrow. As generalists, it's hard for us to make progress on the marrow without just being very detailed about looking for medications that could impact the marrow or looking for nutritional deficiencies that could impact the marrow. Um, but we can make a lot of progress on the periphery. And the progress I think you can make is to put a very specific label on this hemolysis. This is not warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. It's not cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. This is called mixed autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And I think Salsan is here. And I say that because Salsan presented a case of warm autoimmune hemolytic, uh, mixed autoimmune hemolytic anemia to Stefan Zavin not too long ago. And what do you need to know about mixed autoimmune hemolytic anemia? Is just compare it to warm and cold. Compared to warm and cold, it is much more severe. We're seeing that here. And it has almost a 100% rate of a secondary underlying cause. That's in stark contrast to warm and cold, which have a variable rate of idiopathic disease. So there is going to be a specific cause of this hemolytic anemia. So what would we do to work, up, uh, uh, work this up some more? I think we really have to ask ourselves, what could be the underlying cause of this mixed autoimmune hemolytic anemia? And use our suspicion for the bone marrow as a possible clue. So Elena, if you were to, we only have 15 minutes left. So if you were to rapid fire, just like we did yesterday with uh, uh, Bell's palsy, if you were just to sort of free flow associate conditions, you know, that cause a secondary autoimmune hemolytic anemia, what do you think? I think it kind of depends on the age. Um, so we see, for example, more autoimmune phenomenon in younger people um, and in older adults as this gentleman, um, we would more think about um, lymphoproliferative diseases um, from the B cells or the T cells. And I mean, the patient already has one. So um, <laughs> the um, yeah, the uh, thought of relapse is definitely um, scary. Um, and then we would definitely, I mean, the, normally we would scrutinize the, the med list because many um, um, mm. medications can do that. We would definitely ask for over-the-counter medications, also like just NSAID use, um, anti, like recent antibiotic use. Um, and then I think also like connective tissue diseases can do it, um, vasculitides, yeah, things like that. Excellent. Excellent. Now let me ask you this. What do you think about one week of fevers? chills, cough, and a cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Um, but we said it's mixed, right? 
Or okay. you, you're just making... I'm emphasizing the cold okay. just to gener generate a thought for you. <laughs> okay, One week, I think... Fevers, cough. One week of a pneumonia followed by cold agglutination. What do you think? <laughs> I think apart from the things that I've already said, it's yeah. also infections that can yeah. do it. Like, I think especially... Um, EBV, CMV, I think mycoplasma can do it. Exactly. Um, yeah. Cool. Nice job. Really, really nice job. I have nothing to add to that. So here's my tension. The case for a marrow, strong. The case for a secondary non-marrow trigger is also strong because the patient's only been sick for a week. There are very few diseases that cause acute marrow dysfunction on the order of one week. So is the marrow distractor um, or <clears throat> is it where the disease lives? And I think let's not forget how this patient showed up. One week of symptoms. And so it'll be interesting to see how that passes out. One week of symptoms, more compatible with no marrow. <clears throat> but pancytopenia yes, and hypoperiphative reticulocyte, you got to think about it. Kirtan, the tension is palpable. How did you make progress? Perfect. So Rabbi, how about this? For this aliquot, I will give you the data and then you and Elena can like quickly tell me that what the final path would be. And then I will explain what happened because if I don't explain how the things panned out, then it's, it's like a very difficult to wrap mine around that. It's not like just random labs we ordered. There was a reason. So I think we can quickly wrap up this aliquot. Okay. So finally, everything is going on. Patient was not responding to blood transfusions. And meanwhile, ferritin was obtained, which was like above 7,500, which is beyond the detection limit. Meanwhile, the CT scan of the abdomen pelvis was obtained, which showed that there were multiple enlarged mediastinal and bilateral axillary lymph nodes, but they have not changed since 2023 when the patient was diagnosed for the first time. The abdomen pelvis showed that there are multiple enlarged and prominent retroperitoneal pelvic and inguinal lymph nodes and overall this appears to be increased from the last scan which was four months ago there is also diffuse haziness of the retroperitoneal mesenteric fat at this point in time the mycoplasma serology is returned negative we also obtained other testing like hiv hep b hep c syphilis all of which returned negative as well and for mycoplasma we did like everything serology pcr everything was unremarkable and at this point in time, the cold agglutinin titers also eventually came back positive. And th this is the end of this record. So now I would like you guys to tell me that what would be the final diagnosis? Is there any further testing that you would like to pursue? So I don't know, maybe just for the sake of time, I'll, I think that the case for infection has been weakened dramatically by all the negative tests. And so I think the crux of the calculus that uh, that we should do together is what we have found in, in the periphery is the patient has ongoing uh, and uh, ongoing, but also worsening uh, uh, lymphadenopathy. And so, and has a very, very high ferritin. So um, where, what does that do for you? Yeah, I think uh, with um, diffuse or um, disseminated lymphadenopathy, I think we usually go through the just I made mnemonic. I'm going to skip the I because we, we're not so inclined to thinking of infections. Um, so we think of malignancies, liquid or solid, which is definitely very probable here. And a test that I would order to um, get proof or disprove this hypothesis is get a lymph node biopsy if, if mm -hmm. possible. Um, and then for autoimmune, I think... Um, Lupus can do it, sarcoid can do it, uh, Surgens can do it. Um, and then for drugs, um, oh, I think um, I'm not so sure what drugs can do it, actually. And then I think <laughs> for the E, we don't use endocrine, but more uh, substances like IDG4 or um, what was the other one? I'm forgetting. Amyloid. Yeah, awesome. that's it. I think that um, you're right that when you have a case like this with worsening lymphadenopathy, the answer will likely come from the lymph nodes. In general, there's always three tests you want to do in everybody before you remove their lymph node, which is HIV and other infectious causes driven by epidemiological exposure like TB, for example, which is not relevant here. And we have a negative HIV. A syphilis test, 
when you have um, uh, syphilis, the overlap between syphilis and hemolysis is very well described in the form of paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria, which is not actually what's happening here, but that's an important test to exclude. And then finally, an ANA. And um, of course, this case is not classic for lupus, but remember what the AITL stands for is angioimmunoblastic. And so it would be a curious hypothesis to wonder, can somebody develop lupus in the context of treated AITL? And that would be a hypothesis that I would be running through, because if you just change the demographics of this case and you made the case a 35-year-old woman, this would be slam dunk for lupus, right? Worsening lymphadenopathy, a pancytopenia with hemolytic features. So I think that the concern would be that the patient has developed recurrence of AITL or has developed a new hematological disease that a biopsy is necessary for or flow cytometry. Uh, but the checklist before you biopsy in lymph node is always HIV, RPR, ANA. And so I think we, uh, I think in this case, there's no reason to worry about syphilis uh, beyond just its fit. But I think there is reason to suspect lupus given the association of AITL with autoimmune diseases with the eye here being immunoblastic. So I'd be curious before I remove the lymph node in this person to see what their RPR was and then what their ANA was. Uh, but I want to learn from Kirtan. So my team, my friend. No, you guys got it. So firstly, at this point in time, the ANA was obtained. It was also unremarkable. And also the syphilis we obtained like ahead of time itself, along with HIV, which was also unremarkable. So this is how things panned out. That This patient came at like one o'clock in the ICU. And I looked at the labs and I was like, okay, this is very interesting. I should work it up. So I'm writing my notes so that when we write the notes, we also think a lot, right? So like I'm trying to figure out what could be going on. And this is what I came up with that, okay, this person has libido reticularis less racimosa, most likely because of the hyperviscosity in the cutaneous blood vessels, which is likely stemming from the fact that we have CAD. Now, CAD most likely is from lymphopoiferatory disorder or infections. But if you say that it is CAD, then why would your ferritin be low? I mean, why would your ferritin be high and why would your WBC be low, right? So simultaneously, you start wondering if this person has HLH as well. And now there is this lymphadenopathy, which you are not sure if it's recurrence of AITL or if it's another superimposed infection or not. So at this point in time, the soluble interleukin-2 receptors, which we sent eventually also came back very high. We did the bone marrow biopsy, which showed there is marked hemophagocytosis all through the bone marrow. And they couldn't find any evidence of lymphoma in the bone marrow. But as we know that lymphomas are very tricky to diagnose. Flow cytometry, not sensitive enough. Bone marrow, not sensitive enough. And same is true for the lymph node as well. You need to pick your lymph nodes because this person underwent inguinal lymph node, negative. Cervical lymph node, negative. Mediastinal lymph node, negative. Eventually, when the axillary lymph node was accessible enough, they did the excisional biopsy of that and that showed the recurrence of AITL along with positive staining for EBV. EBV, PCR, also more than 2 million in the blood. And all of this resolved rapidly after the right treatment was given. So after everything was diagnosed, patient was placed on HLS-94 protocol. And after being on that protocol, just for like two to three weeks, EBV-PCR vanished, became negative. The patient eventually received treatment for AITL as well. The subsequent PET scan showed all the lymph nodes were shrinking down. So eventually everything calmed down. But the crux of this case is that, that you know, why peril in the web? Like all you see was levodoreticularis and patient was otherwise doing fine but that rash had implications which were so massive because the rash implicated CAD, CAD implicated underlying probably AITL, simultaneously the high ferritin implicated probably some viruses like EBV and EBV is one of those infections which has been linked to AITL as well. So EBV reactivation is not just random reactivation because of immunosuppression but it actually heralds the relapse of AITL as well because EBV will alter the machinery of B cells and T cells and will allow the T cells to proliferate. So that was the final conclusion that this person at the core of everything just said AITL, but that AITL manifested by producing antibodies causing CAD, which caused rash, and it also allowed EBV to reactivate, which caused the HRH. So that's why this presentation was so unique that everything happened in one patient in one night and by the end of the shift, I had written my note, everything was done. And all the things which we postulated in our note, everything came back positive eventually, rather than one, because we thought that everything would be 
mutually exclusive that okay maybe person will have cad and that's the end of the story but the second possibility was is there hlh as well is there ebv as well and is there aitl as well and eventually all four turned positive as well so that was the unique part that how much of a coincidence that can be that all the four hypotheses are positive so that was the final conclusion and you guys got it here's an incredible case and in, and a really powerful i think the the power of the uh, reticulocyte index and the power of what you said to keep monitoring and to see how this disease evolves. Because when this patient comes in with a normal white count and a deep anemia and thrombocytopenia, I think there's no reason to suspect the bone marrow, but the data that you accumulated and then ultimately the ferritin were so, so key. I would emphasize that one thing that I didn't say out loud, but uh, that struck me, but I forgot about it, is the super high LDH. I think when an LDH is 2300, it really, really helps uh, restrict the differential diagnosis to things beyond uh, um, just a hemolytic anemia alone. And it's classically described in TTP because of ischemia, but I've also seen very, very high LDHs and in, in HLH. So even before the ferritin, I think in retrospect, uh, in, invoking a cause of cell destruction beyond hemolysis, in this case, uh, macrophages in eating up and inhaling other cells, I think that clue uh, might have been there from the beginning. But uh, Elena, now you've had the privilege of discussing autologous stem cell transplantation, AITL, causing hemolytic anemia, thrombocytopenia, pancytopenia, high fevers, uh, cold agglutinin disease, levito rastrosa, uh, HLH. <laughs> that was a, a big, big, big bite of medicine. Uh, how do you feel now and what reflections do you have? Yeah, Kitten, uh, thank you so much for bringing this case here. I think I'm like, I mean, I'm still in med school and I think such cases are so rich and I can learn so much from them. And I think um, it's it's like really difficult for me because I don't have the experience uh, to, uh, you go like through your differentials, you get a new data point and then you have like your DDX. Um, but um, I think it really takes like experience and really time in the hospital to like be able to like, put it all together and and know what direction to go. And I'm very excited to learn that once I start residency. Um, yeah, but it was a fantastic um, experience. Thank you to Julia and thank you to Harry for scribing and teaching points. And thank you so much, Robbie, for like helping me uh, get through this case. And um, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, yeah, I think that you're giving it getting a tremendous head start in what is a lifelong process. And yeah, I, I don't forget the feeling of like, it takes so much knowledge and organized knowledge to be able to make progress efficiently and effectively. And I think the earlier you start, the better you end up being. So kudos to you. Um, yeah, thank you, Kirtan. This was so, so such a rich and educational case in so many ways. And I, I can't wait to reflect on the intersection of bone marrow disease and peripheral destruction where uh, HLH definitely lives very strong. Uh, all right, Harry, take us home with your teaching points, please. All right. Awesome case. Uh, I learned a lot. Um, so just briefly, the teaching points, we talked about libido reticularis versus racemosa in the severe form of retiform uh, purpura. Um, it really just comes down to skin ischemia due to vasoconstriction. It can also be hypercoagulable states like we saw in this one. Um, in this case, with the cold agglutination, thrombosis and emboli are other etiologies as well. And then Robbie mentioned uh, when people have abrupt onset of systemic inflammatory syndromes. Um, usually, uh, if it is an infection, it's going to be due to an ex exogenous trigger on top of a, a fragile substrate. Then we talked about stem cell transplants. Uh, typically, folks who are getting allogeneic stem cells really go on uh, induction chemo, which can predispose them to severe infections. But in our case, um, our patient had autologous stem cell transplant, so this is less likely for them. And then we talked about angioimmunoblastic T-cell lymphomas, which um, I learned can present really often with perineoplastic autoimmune syndromes, including hemolytic anemias, like in this case, vasculitis as in cold agglutination, and are also often EBV positive. And then we talked about bicytopenias and pancytopenia. So bicytopenias, typically the differential includes marrow suppression, versus consumptive processes and versus destruction. And then we talked about our intravascular hemolysis, which usually uh, the etiologies can be infectious, complement mediated, including cold, autoimmune, hemolytic anemias, and then shearing such as TMAs. And then we talked about the lower tick index, which I personally hardly ever think about, but uh, Robbie talked about how it leads to uh, the mark of ineffective erythropoiesis versus marrow invasion. 
And then uh, autoimmune hemolytholemia is just most commonly warm, but uh, which are usually IgG and complement positive versus cold, which is typically IgM. In this case, we had a mixed picture, which is usually secondary to another cause, um, including EBV, like in this case, as well as lymphoproliferative disorders, also in this case. And then we talked briefly about uh, differential for diffuse worsening lymphadenopathy, which is infectious as always. It's HIV, syphilis, or TB versus autoimmune, such as lupus versus malignancy, uh, which includes lymphoma, leukemia, as well as HLH, Castleman's um, as well. And that's all I have for you. Uh, that was a market feat to summarize the learning of that hour in uh, two minutes. That was awesome. Thank you so, so much, Harry. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, Kirtan, this was a treat. Mm -hmm. Elena, amazing to reflect with you and to see where you are. And I'm a little bit terrified of what you will become with, um, gosh, just two more years of experience. I think you'll outdo Kirtan and I both. Um, and Julia, thank you so much for scribing and a big, big love to your family and your grandfather. I hope you have a wonderful celebration today. All right, guys, see you next time.